Hello, good evening to everyone. I have a privilege of saying hello and welcome to everyone uh, to our third webinar from the cycle Sound and Music in Child Development. Uh, this is the program of the partnership network of the project Be Air, Art Infinity Radio, creating sound art for baby toddlers and vulnerable groups, co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. Tonight, our theme is the cognitive and social emotional development of preschool children. And it will be presented by Professor Dr. Katarina Habe, a psychologist and a musician, developing her expertise in musical uh, psychology, psychology of music, and also an assistant professor at the Academy of Music, University of Ljubljana. So uh, on the behalf of the Beer Project team, I wish you a third wonderful webinar in this series. Dear Katerina, the Zoom floor is yours. Hello, hello. I was thinking, many of us, many of you uh, was maybe wondering, what about now talking about cognitive and socio-emotional development? Because our topic lies somewhere else in sound and music. But you know why? Music is so uh, importantly interconnected with the holistic development, with motor development, with cognitive de development, and socially emotional, uh, social emotional development that we have to know some basics um, uh, considering co especially cognitive and social emotional um, development. That's why we choose this topic for today's webinar. I hope it will be interesting for you. And I decided that I'm gonna, um, uh, I'm gonna combine um, uh, information uh, from uh, cognitive and socio-emotional development with music development. That's what really matters here. So let me share uh, my presentation with you. So in order to use sound and music in the most effective way, we have to be aware of the key characteristics of child development, especially cognitive and social emotional development. So today's topic is going to be these two areas of child development in relation to music. Um, you have to know that there are many classifications of uh, developmental pre uh, periods of, in preschoolers. So I just decided to use one uh, that classifies newborns from, a, uh, from birth to four weeks, infants from age, uh, four, uh, ages four weeks till one year, toddlers ages from uh, one year to the second year, and preschoolers from two years or two and a half years till five years. And I'm gonna focus especially on infants and toddlers development. And I have to tell you that um, development, uh, child development in this preschool period is so diverse and uh, so huge that we are just like in a um, in a huge sea, develop, a developmental sea, with all the uh, information. What is going on uh, with children uh, at this time? We also know that the um, uh, learning starts even in prenatal period, and so many changes are happening um, uh, until the second of year. So main areas of development that we're going to focus on are motor development, cognitive development, and social de uh, emotional development. Uh, where are we going to combine cognitive uh, development and social uh, emotional de development with motor development is um, uh, closely connected with music. Because um, when we're talking about music, movement is always present. Uh, music with, uh, without movement can't really exist. 
And that's why motor development is going to be included in our topic, even though I'm not going to talk explicitly about it. So, as I said, why it's music is so important in um, child development, because we can um, uh, regard it as a facilitator of a holistic development in children. So we can see that music actually triggers all centers in child's brain. And as I'm going to emphasize later, it's a kind of brain fitness. It's the best brain fitness a child can get. So for the beginning, let us see a short, um, uh, a short excerpt from a documentary of uh, child's brain development to see how important music is with regards to holistic development in children. So, let us start first with cognitive development. The most influential theory in cognitive development is uh, uh, Piaget's, the uh, Piaget's theory, theory of cognitive development. And we're going to focus on the first two phases and these uh, first two stages. And this is sensory motor uh, phase and pre-operational phase. Um, sensory motor phase uh, starts at birth and lasts till the second year. And the most important thing uh, with regard to this stage is that child actually learns by doing. So his cognitive um, uh, system develops through doing things, through looking, through touching, through sucking through hearing, so the child also has a primitive understanding of cause and effect relationships, but this understanding is completely different uh, of, um, in compared to um, uh, cognitive uh, activity in adults. And one important uh, thing that happens during this phase that um, uh, object permanence develop. And this means that a uh, uh, child can be aware that even when you put uh, some object away from his vision, that this object is still there. And this happens only around uh, uh, nine months. Um, and then pre-operational stage begins from the second year till the seventh year. Uh, at this time, two important things happen. The most important thing actually is development of language skills and uh, the use of symbols, including letters and numbers. Uh, uh, in this period, in this stage, child is really totally egocentric in uh, his mind. That means that a child always thinks that what he's thinking, you're thinking also. So it's really interesting when you're talking to a small child, a child, you have to be aware that he will always think that you know what's happening in his head. And um, uh, during this period, at the end of this period, a mental operation uh, start to develop. And one uh, of the most important uh, uh, mental operation that develops at the end of uh, uh, stage of pre-operation uh, is actually conservation. And why this mental operation is so important? It is important because it was also um, explored uh, with regard to music development. And I'm going to address this later. I'm just going to mention two other uh, periods, two other stages that um, are also uh, present in cognitive development. From seven to 11 years, um, concrete operations happen. At that time, the child demonstrates conservation, reversibility, serial ordering, and a mature understanding of cause and effect relationship. Thinking at this stage is still concrete. I always say to my students that um, 
differences between a child, let's say at six, or a child at eight years, it's really enormous. Because in this time, a child develops mental operations. So that means that uh, a child uh, can already be aware how to classify things in similar groups, how to group them from smaller to larger, how to um, uh, be aware that if some dimension uh, changes the thing is still the same so this is really important milestone in between six till eight years i would say and then formal operation or abstract thinking happens from uh, 12 years on uh, at this point individual demonstrates abstract thinking including logic deductive reasoning com uh, comparison and classification so let us uh, go into details with regard to sensory motor stage um, how do you how can you recognize this stage in children they observe everything with all their senses they're like sponges uh, listening to stimuli around them uh, um, uh, watching all that is happening around them touching everything so everything uh, is happening all the learning is happening actually uh, with senses and with motor activity that's why that's where comes this um, naming sensory motor stage uh, at this time a uh, child still doesn't talk so there is absence of language and um child actually vocalizes if i'm talking about sounds and music in bubbling we can see that the child is actually communicating with us um, with melody especially with intonation and rhythm of uh, their talking so um, there is a um, music language that uh, um, is present before language um, children have no words for things objects uh, and they cease to exist these things cease to exist when children are not dealing directly with them interactions with uh, the environment are strictly sensory motor and deal only with the here and now so the reality for child is that the thing that they can hear, that they can see, that they can touch, exists for them. And the thing that is not there, they're not aware of. It isn't present for them. During this stage, infants interact with and learn about their environment by relating their sensory experiences, such as uh, hearing and seeing, to their motor actions, like mouthing and grasping. So if you give children um, different sound um, uh, instruments uh, or rattles or whatever, they will always put them into their mouth because they're learning through their mouth. That's why everything has to be uh, touched and everything has to be actually um, uh, put in mouth. Uh, during this stage, uh, senses, reflexes, and motor abilities develop rapidly. So you can see how huge difference it is between child uh, when he is born or, or uh, at the year two when this uh, stage actually um, uh, goes into pre-operational stage. Intelligence is first displayed when reflex movements become more refined, such as when an infant will reach for a preferred toy and will suck on a nipple and not a pacifier when hungry. Understanding of the world involves only perceptions and objects with which the infant has directly experienced. As I said, uh, the thing that um, is present for a child is his real reality. And what I already mentioned, child is, child is totally 
egocentric in this stage. Everything is seen with themselves as a frame of reference and their psychological world is the only one that exists. And uh, at the end, uh, I was saying at, um, let's say around uh, nine months, uh, children develop the concept of object permanence. In other words, that means that they come to realize that objects go on existing even when they're not experiencing them. And that's why children in this phase really love playing uh, hide and seek, you know, um, or peekaboo. If, if you um, put um, hands like this, and then do like this. This is a very interesting game uh, for them and they're enjoying this game because in um, that way they're developing, uh, they're, they're actually developing and learning about object permanence. And there comes another stage at the age of two and this is pre-operational stage. Um, uh, and this stage lasts till seven years, uh, and it actually is um, uh, put into two stages. During this stage, children learn to use symbols, and the most important thing that happens is actually that um, a child um, uh, starts forming mental images. And in order to do this, uh, they have to develop language and they have to develop um, uh, symbols because they use them when doing these mental images. And they solve simple problems um, uh, and uh, these simple pro problems are actually learning uh, uh, for them. Uh, a child at this stage can't think really logically. Um, it's um, important that you know that child has a different logic that we do. Everything, even objects, uh, have um, like a soul. They think they're alive. And when you when you ask a child to, uh, when he's playing with a stone or when he's playing with a brick or a stick, uh, they're always considering these things as they were alive. And we're talking about animism. That's a um, characteristic of a pre-operational stage. And another characteristic of pre-operational stage is finalism. Uh, child thinks that um, all the things are happening uh, because of them. So if you ask a child in this stage, why is it raining? Uh, a child will answer to you, so I can wear my um, boots for raining, or so I can um, uh, jump into, in, into puddles. So their logic is so different than um, of the children in concrete uh, um, uh, logical stage. But uh, for me, I have to admit, this is the most interesting and the most funny stage uh, um, in your own children. Um, so, as I already mentioned, we have two different stages. We have uh, the first stage from the year two till the year uh, four, and this is uh, preconceptual thinking. So, we're actually talking with regard to our focus on infants and toddlers about sensory motor stage and about preconceptual thinking in pre-operational stage. At this preconceptual thinking, children begin uh, some basic concept formation. They began to classify things in certain classes because they are similar, but they're making mistakes. So if you ask a child, no, let's make an example like this. If a child sees a man that's wearing long hair, he's going to say uh, that is a lady because um, usually ladies wear longer um, hair. Or if a child sees a chihuahua, he can say, oh, what a nice, um, what a nice cat because 
um, Chihuahua is by uh, visual characteristics more uh, it more resembles on cat than on um, uh, dog uh, even if you hear the sound of Chihuahua maybe it's more like a cat than a dog and uh, another uh, thing that happens a uh, child at this uh, age uh, use concepts in really simplified way. Uh, they uh, can tell, uh, they can say to all men that they are daddies and all women are mommies or all um, women are um, uh, aunts and all men are uh, uncles. So we have to know that uh, Cognitive uh, concepts are really qualitatively different uh, from children to adults. The other uh, stage in this pre-operational stage is intuitive thinking. Uh, at, uh, at the end of this intuitive thinking, child already uh, develops conservation. And this is an important um, uh, mental operation uh, as I already, uh, already said, this operation was all also explored in music, and I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna give an example that is most uh, uh, famous. You do experiments with two glasses. Uh, you have two similar glasses with uh, the same amount of water, and then you pour uh, from this one of these glasses, the water into glass that is um, uh, larger. And you ask ch uh, a child if there is this, uh, the same amount of uh, water. And a child that is in pre-operational stage, uh, he's gonna say, well, no, it's different because he's gonna see that visually it looks different. But what really happens at the end of uh, seventh year, actually it's in between six and seventh year, it's that a child knows that the water is still the same. So if you put it in a different glass, it's still the same amount of water. So you can see one huge difference, qualitative difference in uh, child's cognitive uh, development. And with regard to music, uh, uh, how, how can this be observed in music? Um, if you give a child to listen to two examples, short examples of music. And let's say um, that the second example just varies in rhythm. So just small rhythmic changes, but otherwise the same music uh, is present. And a child at pre-operational stage will say, no, this is completely different. These two um, uh, examples differ, uh, differ between themselves. But a child in concrete operational stage will say, well, no, actually, uh, uh, melody is the same, but the rhythm change. So a child will know, or you can just um, uh, you can just um, change a little bit of a melody, or you can play um, with different instrument. A child in preparational stage uh, will say that these are two different music examples. But a child in concrete operational uh, stage will know that the source is the same, just a little changes with regard to rhythm, with regard to timbre, uh, uh, timber, with regard to melody has been made. So, uh, as I was saying, these concepts of um, cognitive development were also explored in music. The two uh, uh, authors uh, that explored this most extent, uh, extensively were um, uh, Zimmermann and Seraphine. And uh, these examples I was talking about, um, they made experiments with them, especially um, uh, Seraphine made a lot of studies with regard to this. 
there are three assumptions concerning the core elements of Piaget's theory and their application to music. The first assumption is that applying Piaget's theory in musical development means investigating in its rational aspect, uh, especially musical thinking. Uh, so, as I was saying, all these concepts, especially conservation, was put into musical domain. The second assumption is that um, due to de uh, development of musical thinking is consistent with Piaget's formalized theory of the transition from the pre-operational stage to the stages of concrete operations and formal thinking. Thus, findings on musical th uh, tasks are reconcilable, uh, reconcilable with these stages. So, if I put it a little bit simpler, that means that especially this transition between pre-operational thinking to concrete uh, operational uh, thinking was um, uh, extensively explored. And the third uh, assumption is that key concepts uh, underlying the Piaget to a theory of intellectual growth is actually conservation, as I have already mentioned. So, how can music be used to promote cognitive development? Uh, as I already mentioned, using music is a kind of a brain fitness. And if you recall our uh, last session with Professor uh, Zvezdan Pirtoshek and with Albinza, Professor Albinza Pesek, you can um, uh, recall that um, all brain areas are um, uh, activated when listening, but especially when actively involved in music, when singing or playing instruments. And if you look at a small child, uh, he's always uh, making music, either with his vocal cords, either with different things, uh, with stones, with water, uh, with um, fork uh, um, and a spoon. Child is really totally fascinated with sounds. And that's why he's learning, he's uh, actually uh, enhancing his cognitive ability uh, throughout the music. So what can we do uh, with using music? We can actually promote attention and concentration in children. Um, one of the good things in this is using music listening. Uh, and um, using music listening as a pre-task, that means that uh, actually like a priming effect in our brain happens. That means like... Um, our uh, brain are, is warming up for concentrating, for being more attentive. Uh, so one way of using uh, music for um, increasing attention and concentration is listening right music, especially uh, let's say Mozart music or Baroque music before some uh, concentrational, simple concentrational uh, task. And the other thing is if we want to use music uh, during um, do, uh, doing some skills, you have to use music really as a sound background. So uh, children are not really aware of, and this is actually doing uh, changes more on the subconscious level, uh, where alpha brain wave um, uh, activity is present. Uh, and especially um, uh, good with this regard uh, are uh, some uh, music examples at YouTube. It's actually alpha brain wave music. And if you put it um, uh, as a background, uh, children really are more atten uh, attentive. Um, so uh, we can use music for increasing attention and concentration. I'm gonna also address Mozart effect 
uh, a little bit further. Uh, the other things, uh, uh, thing that can be uh, increased with music with regard to cognitive development is memory. Uh, me so memorizing through music. When, when children are learning new words in their uh, own language or in foreign language, they're learning um, uh, more efficiently, uh, faster when they're using music, when they're singing or when they're listening uh, to, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, cartoons uh, with words and music. So they're memorizing through music better. Uh, with regard to intelligence, um, there are different uh, uh, studies and various studies, but as, as a psychologist, I have to say that uh, the most um, explored thing uh, is spatial temporal reasoning, and this is actually a preface of intelligence. It's a, a prerequisition for um, abstract thinking. So, especially this spatio-temporal intelligence can be um, increased through music, but this is actually, as I said, a keystone for building intelligence. And, uh, of course, language development is closely connected uh, to music. Uh, many studies show that children with more developed musical abilities have also more uh, developed literacy, especially uh, uh, with regard to language development, we can see a significant interrelation, uh, interrelatedness between um, uh, musical abilities and phonological awareness. So. And I have to uh, uh, talk also about Mozart effect because that was actually a topic of my doctorate thesis. And this is the thing that I really love uh, talking about um, because there is still a lot of contradictory information about it. So what is actually Mozart effect? This is um, uh, this actually involves neurophysiological uh, uh, changes, which which can be observed in increased upper alpha brain waves as consequence of listening to the first movement of the Mozart sonata for two pianos in D major, um, Kehl 448 on spatio temporal uh, temporal reasoning. it a little bit simpler. Mozart effect means that if we listen to a uh, first movement of Mozart's sonata, so we first listen to it and our brain starts working more attentively, so we un increase our concentration and this results in the way that we can actually solve problems uh, in spatial temporal task more effectively. Um, so what are these spatial temporal tasks? Uh, how to uh, orient yourself in labyrinth or how uh, as a small child, how to put puzzle together, how, how fast you can put this puzzle together. So our research has shown that this increased upper alpha brain waves uh, actually enhance a special a spatio temporal reasoning of a child. Uh, but there was actually the most important question, why Mozart? Uh, because why not use Bach? Why not use uh, Beethoven? Why not use uh, some other composer or pop music or one music that we really love? Uh, 
um, uh, they made uh, many researches and uh, there were many hypotheses what is actually reason why Mozart has so beneficial effects on uh, cognitive, um, uh, um, cognitive activity. Uh, there are uh, many hypotheses, but the three important ones are tension relaxation balance. And uh, I'm going to show you one um, uh, video uh, because they made uh, um, experiment uh, of how are uh, elements of tension and relaxation in music combining. And these experiments have shown that in um, Mozart's music, this Tension and relaxation uh, balance is in perfect. Uh, it's in a perfect ratio. Uh, another hypothesis was that um, uh, high frequencies are the ones influencing um, uh, alpha brainwave uh, activity. And the third thing was a golden ratio. So this golden ratio wasn't um, confirmed, but the other uh, first ones were confirmed. Actually, in Mozart's music, the amount of high frequencies um, was um, uh, significant higher than in other um, in other uh, chosen music they made a, like a computer um, uh, uh, computer uh, um, uh, combination of uh, different uh, music elements and uh, they found that with that uh, exploration and um, uh, with regard to tension and relaxation it's it's the same so um, Mozart effect has really a uh, huge implication uh, with regard to clinical setting and also with regard to educational setting. With uh, regard to educational setting, um, uh, it was seen that you can uh, promote better um, concentration when you give children or uh, or students or adults to listen to this Mozart sonata as a kind of warm up for better brain functioning. But it was especially beneficial in those um, in those uh, um, participants who uh, um, weren't that um, developed uh, with regard to their spatial temporal reasoning. The ones that were already excellent, they didn't need it, uh, but the ones that still have, uh, uh, still had um, a place to develop, this was like a tool for um, uh, um, being better with regard to spatial temporal reasoning. And with regard to clinical implication, it was seen that uh, in all patients that uh, patients that had uh, problems um, uh, with spatial uh, temporal reasoning, like in Parkinson's disease, like uh, in Alzheimer's disease, after strokes, um, also in uh, epilepsy, these um, uh, effects emerged. So. Uh, I'm going to stop now and I'm going to show you uh, one explanation uh, with regard to tense attention relaxation balance, why Mozart music has such a huge effect. But I also put here a link to the whole uh, documentary, Testing Mozart, a film about Mozart effect. So I suggest to all of you that are, that are interested in this topic to watch it later. So, so much about cognitive development and we're skipping now to emotional development. But I can see that all these topics are so huge that I could talk just about cognitive development all the time. <laughs> okay, let's go further. So let's, gonna, uh, let's continue with social emotional development in infants and toddlers. Um, 
from the year, from the birth till the year two and a half, child is learning how to regulate and express emotions in socially and culturally appropriate ways. A child explores the an, uh, environment and learn, all in the context especially of family, community and culture. It is necessary when we're talking about socially, socio-emotional development to talk about um, temperament of a child, to talk about attachment styles of a child, and to talk about um, developing social skills. You have to know that personality of an infant or of a toddler, uh, it's uh, actually about um, developing temperament. Uh, we can talk about babies that are easy or flexible, we can talk about babies that are difficult or feisty, and we can talk about slow to warm up or fearful babies. And uh, all these three different types of temperament um, dictate how also the environment is gonna react to child and how a child is gonna react to the environment. Uh, the other important issue with regard to social emotional development is um, uh, attachment of a child. Actually, um, secure attachment of a child, it's a keystone for uh, building all the relationships uh, ships later on in our life. So we can talk um, about a secure or insecure um, attachment and uh, insecure attachment is, uh, is also divided into ambivalent, avoidant and uh, disordered um, uh, attachment. And this we can see like this, that if a child is um, uh, securely attached, when um, a child is put into fearful um, situation, he, he starts crying when uh, his parent or someone who he's attached to uh, lives. Uh, and when this person comes back, uh, child at first, uh, he looks a little bit about, um, at uh, this person and then he hugs uh, this person and he cuddles with this person. So this means he's securely attached. But the children the, that don't have um, uh, the opportunity to fulfill their needs for security. So when they're crying and um, parent doesn't come or when they're hungry and uh, they're not given food or if they're, um, uh, if they need diaper changing and there's no one there to do that for them. Uh, so they, if, if um, that happens many times, children um, develop unsecured insecure attachment. So they do not really know what will happen uh, if this person will really come or not come. So they uh, develop unsecure uh, attachment. And as I already mentioned, this, uh, the third thing with regard to social emotional development is developing social skills such as uh, self-regulation. So not to lose temper when you're really angry, not to bite a um, uh, little uh, friend. Uh, if you're angry, um, uh, child also develops empathy he develops turn-taking and sharing and positive relationships with adults and peers. And with regard to all these three um, uh, main, uh, 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 main concepts in um, social emotional development, we can use music. How we can use music with regard to temperament? We can regulate uh, temperament with uh, using soothing music, or we can regulate temperament like this. If um, a child is really angry, we can uh, give uh, give a child drums to um, express his anger. So then 
it's gone, you know. Um, so we can regulate temperament with uh, musical activity. We can use music to form secure attachment with, uh, with a child. If we are um, singing uh, to an infant on, or to a toddler, we're actually bonding uh, with a child. Uh, we're uh, putting a, sec a secure environment, also this um, uh, auditive environment to a child. Uh, so especially soothing is um, uh, singing to children, but uh, if you recall our later um, uh, um, uh, webinar with Albinza Pesek, uh, you could see how also um, uh, how also this uh, uh, sound bath uh, bath can uh, positively influence on um, building security in children, and with regard to social skills. Uh, if you are uh, choosing um, didactic, uh, didactic games for uh, uh, musically involving children, uh, you are also developing empathy in children, um, uh, turn taking and sharing small instruments. And um, through this musical activity, uh, children are actually building positive relationships with adults at, uh, and peers. Um, we could say that uh, especially through singing, uh, child, uh, is, uh, a child and a caregiver are tuning themselves. So even if when a child is crying, uh, if you start uh, humming on the same frequency uh, that a child uh, uh, in which child is crying and then put it a little bit um, um, uh, uh, more um, quieter and quieter uh, a child can start uh, can um, keep quiet of crying you know so you can tune and regulate uh, with a child's emotion with playing with your own voice uh, and one interesting thing I have to tell you about that uh, when child is crying, there are different patterns of crying. There is one uh, really interesting study made by uh, Priscilla Dunstan, that is an uh, Australian opera singer, and she explored five different uh, patterns of uh, vocalization before child's crying. If you type into YouTube, um, uh, Priscilla Dunstan uh, and Oprah, you're going to get a small excerpt and um, uh, small samples how um, uh, you can tell what a child wants to tell you with different uh, sound pattern of their cry. And another interesting thing about child crying is that um, uh, child cry is really very simple till the third um, month and uh, in these first three months you can actually say uh, by these five patterns of um, crying uh, basic needs of a child let's say um, uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm hungry I need to burp uh, I have a colicals or I um, uh, I'm a disease so uh, it's really interesting how soothing it can be if you can tell from a child's cry what their basic needs are. Uh, and another interesting thing is that uh, if you analyze child's crying, the patterns in child's crying are the same as patterns in um, uh, their native language. So it's like really kind of magic. And we can see actually that music is so much inborn in our human genome. Okay, so 
what are the most important thing, uh, important things with regard to social emotional uh, development in infancy? Uh, I would say that the most important thing is actually that um, uh, during the first year, a child is actually developing um, uh, his autonomy from uh, his uh, total uh, dependency at the beginning at uh, his birth. And um, a child starts exploring, especially when his motor um, apparatus is uh, developing. So when child starts uh, crawling and he's going away from uh, uh, caregivers, he's testing what's happening. Are my parents still there? Uh, am I secure? What can I do? But this exploration, uh, this um, uh, experimenting, actually develops their cognitive apparatus and also uh, social emotional comp uh, competence because um, a child is actually building on his autonomy. Um, uh, so first emotional expressions in child are uh, smiling. Uh, so these social, uh, social smiles that happened at, um, let's say, about six weeks of a child, uh, these are actually first relations to social environment of a, uh, of a child. Uh, the expression of sadness, on the other hand, encourages empathy and helping behavior. And the expression of anger in infants and toddlers single, uh, sing, uh, signals protest and discomfort. Um, infants and toddlers have a unique tendency to experience and express particular emotions and the threshold for expressing those emotions uh, is usually referred to as their temperament or characteristic emotionality as i have already mentioned um i would say uh, i'm, uh, I'm gonna also uh, address this thing that during the second six months of life as infants gain rudimentary cognitive and memory capacities child begins to express particular emotion based on context because before that their um, um, emotional um, uh, reactions are based just on primary caregivers uh, especially on primary caregivers um, since we're coming to, to one hour of my presentation, I'm gonna just skip this and um, talk about two the most important um, phases, two important stages by Eric Erikson, who explored social emotional development um, during our uh, lifespan. And he said that uh, from the birth till 18 months, a uh, child is developing um, a concept of trust versus mistrust. So if basic needs of a child are um, uh, 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 um, recognized uh, by caregiver, that means that a child will um, develop trust. So major question of a child in this uh, time is, can I trust the people around me? And from 18 months till the third year, um, child is building autonomy versus shame and doubt. Um, I already said that at this time, child is already uh, walking around and exploring his environment. And on the other hand, he starts using language. So um, with this motor and on the other hand, also cognitive development, um, he's becoming more and more autonomous. And if we give them place to be autonomous uh, um, so that child can't can do things on their own, um, they're building 
their feeling of um, autonomy. And I uh, many times say that at this time, children uh, are actually starting developing their self-esteem because they're gaining um, uh, um, uh, feedback how successful they are in doing the right um, uh, things, you know? So children want to do things on their own at this period of time. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to give a uh, place to your questions, is how can music be used to promote social emotional development? Um, as I already mentioned, music is a kind, uh, music is a form of attachment between caregiver and a child. So when caregivers are singing to a child, when they're communicating with mother is, that means that they're communicating with kind of um, a more expressed voice, more rhythmic voice, mid, mid, uh, with voice in higher pitch like this. Oh, how cute you are. Look at you, what you are doing, you know? they're actually making a bond between a child and a caregiver. Uh, the other thing is music can be uh, used as a regulator of emotions. So if you, you see that a child is really um, excited and he wants to calm down, that he's really tired, and on, um, you can use um, soothing music or you can also sing like a lullaby and also use movements to promote, uh, to regulate child's emotion. Um, uh, as I already mentioned, also musical activities can be a form of emotional catharsis, especially drumming. Children can use various things for drumming. You can see that they use pots from kitchen. They, whatever they see, they, they start drumming. And this is a kind of catharsis uh, of um, uh, really um, uh, expressive emotions in them. Um, musical activities can also be used as a source of building positive self-esteem in children because in musical activities, children are successful because they're experimenting, they're playing with music, they're inventing their songs, singing all the time, playing all the time. And if they get, uh, if they get positive feedback, they are building on their positive self-esteem. And uh, so we can say that musical activities as a facilitator of developing social emotional com uh, competencies are with regard to bonding with peers, sharing toys, uh, in, uh, toy instruments, listening and waiting for others to play when you're using small instruments and adjusting in playing with others. So um, music has really so gross amount of uh, effects that uh, it's kind of magic what we can really do with it. So uh, I also had two other videos prepared for you, but I'm gonna take time now for your questions. And if we still have time at the end, I'm gonna show these two videos. The uh, one is about how you can promote um, holistic development uh, of a child uh, with um, uh, developing, extensively developing musical, uh, music abilities, especially absolute pitch, with using complex musical skills, um, this is one um, excerpt, and the other, um, the other thing is um, with regard to how music affects on the holistic de uh, development of a child. But let me uh, stop here, and I'm giving um, now a uh, word to you. Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Oh, hopefully, I'm gonna uh, uh, have you research if listening of uh -huh. 
Have you researched if listening of Mozart sonata uh, for two pianos is used in elementary school since there are benefits for children, uh, child development? That's, uh, um, uh, that's a question from Natasha Bonacci. No, I actually did my research on uh, students, but uh, first researches uh, that were done by um, Rauscher and Cho were uh, conducted also on children and on rats. So uh, these um, uh, um, experiments uh, were actually confirmed with regard to small children and also in rats because um, uh, they were solving them with labyrinth. How, uh, how fast they came um, from one side of the labyrinth to the other. And it was shown that uh, they solved this, this problem more effectively, uh, faster, when they were listening to music, um, uh, to Mozart sonata, um, in compared to listening other excerpts or music or being in silence. So hopefully I questioned this one. Have you researched if listening of Mozart sonata is your, uh, this is the one. Could we get the links here in chat or we will get it later by, by email? You will get all links are um, in my, um, uh, in, uh, also in my presentation. So all links can also be seen in that. So in B Air, uh, our um, uh, panel, you're gonna see everything. Okay. Oh, Priscilla Dancer, okay. Please feel free to ask your question. My question, uh -huh. Giuseppe, my question, which I admit is a bit provocative. I love provocative questions, Giuseppe. I agree with Mozart as an alternative to pop, blues or Beethoven, but uh, have any reaction been tested with Salieri? Ha! Huh. I mean, one could reach reaction more on a, a psychoacoustic basis than on an artistic one. Does Mozart's adagio in pianism, uh, pianissimo for string uh, in G major have certain effects because it's Mozart, because it's adagio, because it is in G major, because it is placed by string, or because is it pianissima? That's a great question, um, Giuseppe. And that was really a huge uh, debate among um, uh, between uh, musicologists, music pedagogues, and uh, the ones that are more um, biologically, neurologically oriented. And I have to tell you, me as a musician, when I start exploring Mozart effect, I actually uh, started exploring uh, this effect because I was convinced that uh, there can't be a difference so huge in compared to other um, uh, musical uh, examples. But I was amazed because we use different types of music that actually uh, Mozart sonata actually has different effect than other music. This alpha brain wave of activity could be observed in EEG studies. So uh, I was not doing just experimental studies, but I was doing also this EEG studies where we could see that uh, uh, brain activities were different uh, in using Mozart sonata or using different musical activities. So I suggest you to look this um, uh, great documentary because this um, debate that is still going on um, uh, is nicely explored there. But uh, I understand your question. I can relate to it. So thank you, Giuseppe. Okay. Hi, really wonderful lecture. I'm, do, uh, I'm doing one song at the moment. 
Uh, did you have experience with it? No, Dubra, Dubroka, I uh, haven't had experience with a wand. Um, uh, what I was um, what I was reading um, uh, of was uh, uh, about studies how children um, are developing their cognitive motor and um, uh, uh, social emotional abilities already in prenatal period. So um, uh, there were interesting studies I wrote somewhere from one ne neurologist, Vermke. I, I think she's uh, she is um, uh, she she is uh, neuroscience also from uh, Alexandra Lemont, if I recall correctly, uh, that already children in prenatal period learn uh, musical examples. So when they are born, they uh, they recall on these examples that they were listening to uh, in this prenatal period. So they recognize what kind of music they were listening. So they used it uh, for um, um, uh, soothing babies. They were preparing mothers when they were pregnant to listen to classical music with um, uh, um, a slower tempo to relax themselves. And when children are born, children recognize this music excerpts and they relax. Uh, they relaxed with regard to this music that they already knew, and they could distinguish between different sample, uh, different musical examples that they listened to in prenatal periods. So, but I would love to know more about these uh, things that you're working on. So, hopefully, uh, you're gonna show, uh, you're gonna share your work. Okay, let. Let's go further. My question, this is from Sashka, which I admit is a bit uh, How movement in music, rhythmical mu uh, movement, body percussion connects with brain development in children? Huh. If you observe um, music activity of a child, you can't really uh, separate music from uh, movement, because even when a child is uh, listening to uh, music, he's actually synchronizing his moves with the music he's listening to. So we, we cannot separate music and movement. This is totally interconnected. Um, so when a child is um, uh, um, uh, when a child is doing body percussion, that's actually a best way to de uh, developing a child's um, a child's um, uh, rhythmic skills because um, these two important elements, body and rhythm, are connected. Um, I do uh, not know exactly how this can be observed in brain in children. I just know these studies uh, that I was addressing to you about. So let's go further. Uh, this is, thank you. Do you know if Mozart, haha. Uh, do you know if Mozart Sonata is used somewhere else but in therapy? This is a question uh, from Natasha. Um, yes, of course, it's not used uh, for therapy, of course not. It's, uh, as I was saying, it can be used in clinical setting, but um, uh, it, uh, it's uh, widely used also in educational setting. When I was working on these um, uh, experiments of Mozart um, uh, effect, uh, I got in touch with um, uh, Dr. Shaw from uh, 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 University of California, Irvine, and we met and he showed me their program um, and uh, they were actually um, uh, doing like a 
the computer programs using music, combining uh, music with uh, math skills and computer games for ch small children to increase increase their um, uh, skills of uh, abstract uh, reasoning. So yeah, it was used, but I say, um, I'm saying many times that it can be used even more widely. So let's go further. Mm -hmm. From Alesh, uh, do you know perhaps if there is a window, a span where children are able to achieve perfect pitch? And if that possible vanishes when children get older and window closes? Yes, Alesh, um, actually the uh, uh, um, uh, video that I have prepared for you um, is talking about this. So uh, especially till the second a year, um, uh, neurological um, uh, base, uh, the neurological background is most open to um, uh, to develop perfect pitch, but uh, not just two years. Uh, it was also confirmed that also prenatal period is important. So in Uriel, already um, uh, in prenatal period, uh, enhancing uh, holistic de development with uh, complex musical stimuli uh, is promoted. So yes, especially um, till the second year, there is um, a window um, uh, for uh, developing uh, absolute pitch with more ease, I would say, because if we know that our brain uh, is plastic, that means that we can learn whenever, but uh, we have to know that if we're learning to have absolute pitch later on, we have to have a lot of, we, we have to put a lot of a lot of time, a lot of effort into um, developing absolute uh, absolute pitch, but it's not impossible. It is possible. Also, also Eva from Martina. Uh, da, da, da. I have okay. Um. Hi, dear. The same experiments you were talking about with opening with opening music of TV shows, the newborns recognize uh, recognizes just after the birth. We'll talk uh, more about this next week. Oh, I'm happy, Martina. You're with us. So um, I invite you all um, to be here with us next week because Martina is my friend. She's Martina. Martina Pestai, uh, cat, um, uh, chief. Uh, uh, head of Child uh, and Youth Program on um, National uh, Television Slovenia, but she's also media uh, psychologist, and we're gonna discuss of uh, on all of these topics, interesting topics in practice in uh, television. And and in uh, with uh, Aida Ros in um, uh, puppetry uh, theater. So it will be really interesting. So thank you, Martinka, for this, uh, uh, your comment. Do you know, um, this is this, thank you, uh, Blaska. You mentioned a connection between music and language development. Is it possible that children who were raised speaking two or more languages have greater musical abilities? Mm. Uh, I'm not really aware of this, um, of these uh, um, uh, uh, studies, but I know that the children who have greater musical abilities can um, uh, can uh, learn, especially in the preschool period, um, uh, 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 foreign languages more uh, effectively. So especially, 
as I uh, said, phonological awareness is uh, interrelated with musical abilities. And if they wanted to promote um, uh, phono uh, uh, phonological awareness, they were using several musical abilities, especially singing, to uh, enhance uh, language development. But um, uh, with regard to your question, I'm not sure I wasn't reading any um, uh, any researches with regard to that, but probably there are many. Okay, let's go further. Oh, how many messages? Oh, ho, ho, ho. for this information. Okay. For, uh, from Murat Ozdemir, thank you for this amazing presentation. Have you ever worked with deaf or deaf or hard or uh, hearing children? Do you know of any studies how, uh, how deaf, hard hearing children experience these development uh, development stages? No, Murat, I'm sorry, I'm not um, aware of these studies, um, but I, I'm uh, hopefully we're gonna address these questions in autumn when we uh, um, uh, um, uh, highlight uh, the connection between music and connection between different um, children, different gr groups of children with special needs. So sorry, I can't answer on this question. Maya, tell again about pattern of children crying, please. Okay, uh, as I said, um, uh, uh, Priscilla Dunstan uh, said that there are five different patterns of crying. They're not uh, actually patterns of crying. They're patterns of uh, sounds that children do before crying. Um, let's say, uh, I know one one sound is meh, like uh, one sound is more like a um, uh, harsh sound when when um, a child is uh, really uh, in huge tensions when uh, he's having colicals. But please uh, um, uh, search from for this on YouTube because you're going to hear how different does it sound and how you can recognize um, different patterns from uh, concrete um, uh, examples. Okay, let's go further. Katarina Stekic. Are there any long, uh, longitudinal studies of the Mozart effect? As I know, Katarina, no, but there are many studies, uh, more contemporary studies that have been done on Mozart effect. And I would also suggest you to look on this page of B Air um, that is on Radio R's page. Um, because uh, prof uh, prof um, Professor Primari Ivan Rauning who was, uh, was talking with one professional, one doctor that was exploring uh, Mozart effect in uh, epilepsy. And there are some new interesting findings with regard to that. But I'm not aware of any longitudinal studies. As I've understood, these effects are all quite temporary. You're right, Katarina. I'm also interested compared to what music has Mozart showed to be superior to. Um, uh, I would here address to you um, studies. Hmm. Ooh, uh, I can't re recall the name of the researcher who was dealing especially with this uh, with this. Um, I think because they used like uh, 2000 musical different musical pieces and they were doing uh, they were doing computer analysis of different musical elements in these musical pieces and um, uh, with all of these uh, musical pieces, Mozart, um, Mozart music was the most inf uh, effective in um, uh, uh, increasing uh, concentration. But all the um, examples that are uh, that were similar in um, the amount of high frequency in music um, had um, uh, similar effects 
as Mozart, but not as efficient as Mozart. So um, here was the answer that um, amount of high frequencies in Mozart music is question of uh, is uh, the answer for these beneficial effects of uh, Mozart's music. These are studies that show that our children enjoy Hazard Kyle at least temporary. So I'm curious that uh -huh. yeah i i uh i um answered your question but uh i can also tell you uh, what musical excerpts we used in our study uh we we did experiment eg experiment uh this, this was like a preliminary study and uh, we were testing if really um, a musical complexity on one side and the, uh, on the other side um, uh, uh, appreciation of music how much you like some musical expert uh, excerpt uh, influences brain activity so we use Brahms um, uh, Hungarian dances we use Mozart uh, as the most complex um, uh, music and uh, this uh, musical example was all, also the most um, uh, preferred musical example from uh, all the listeners and we use then Mozart sonata first sentence and then we used silence so with this preliminary uh, study we eliminate uh, complexity of music and uh, preference for music influences uh, higher brain activity because um, concentration was still mostly increased by Mozart music, even uh, even though Mozart music was less liked than, let's say, um, uh, uh, Hungarian dances. Okay, let's go further. Okay. Uh, is it better for development of children one to three years old in kindergarten sit or stand while we are singing children's song? Um, it, the, most, uh, the, the most effective uh, is to uh, actually move the whole body. So yes, to, to, to stand is much better because because uh, it's much more natural of a child. Uh, but sometimes you can also um, use it when children are sitting, you know, it's no problem uh, because uh, you're also developing attentive skills of uh, children when they're singing and they have to sit. But even when they're sitting, it's good to uh, to make uh, to make movements with their body, to clap their hands, uh, singing along, or to to move in one way or another. Okay. So uh, another thing, also when you're teaching young children um, new songs, it's important. But kindergarten teachers use uh, use this like regularly, that you're always uh, um, uh, doing um, uh, expressions with your hands of what is happening in song so if it was big we do with hands like it was big um, we were sleeping are you sleeping are you sleeping so we're always combining movements and uh, music oh dear katarina if i understand well the so-called primitive cultures grow up and educated children by singing, dancing, socializing, and then telling by telling a storytelling. And if I understand well again, we in our own modern educational system slowly, slowly try to understand and do the same, but still far away. Yeah, you're completely right. This is a question from Borut, actually a comment from Borut. Yes, um, Borut, uh, I um, uh, <laughs> I make fun many times out of uh, human society because 
we're kind of so stupid. We have our inborn capacities and we know what to do. If you look at a child, a child instinctively, um, instinctively plays with music and um, uh, uh, our culture was um, primarily musically oriented. And as we developed as intellectual beings, we actually regressed to stage when we were using music less and less. So uh, what about now? When we see these neurological uh, studies that they're confirming how beneficial music uh, is, we're coming back to our roots. So back to our music origins again. Yeah, thank you, Borut. You were uh, observing correctly. Can you recommend some studies about the age of the child, the complexity of music pieces they can play? Some examples. Okay. About this, how complex music they can play, I'm not an, a, an real expert about, but I can tell you that with regard to listening to music, it's very interesting that um, uh, small children, even infants and toddlers, can be quite attentive listeners to really diverse uh, musical genres. Even um, uh, contemporary experimental music can be interesting to, uh, to them, especially if it's using uh, uh, environmental sounds, like sounds from nature or sounds from um, uh, traffic or uh, sounds they're listening uh, around them. So um, uh, with regard to that, um, uh, children can really comprehend and be stimulated with really complex music. And uh, um, uh, this video that uh, you can um, later watch, Neural, you can see how complex this musical um, uh, examples can actually be. But we, uh, with regard to um, uh, uh, playing music, um you can see you you can see how far can you go with with a child you can um uh, uh you you have to start uh, first by developing these rhythmical skills because these rhythmical skills are really um present in every individual this is like moving in a child the child so if you if you're using different um different uh drums or, uh, 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 related drum kits um uh, the, you, you can't really do any mistake but i think that more about the, uh, more about this issue is going to be um uh um, set in uh, our webinar of Katarina Zadnik when she's gonna talk which when she's gonna interview uh, Sara Smerikar and uh, um, I can't recall uh, another um, uh, another expert, but uh, the other expert is from Willem's uh, Pedagogy, and Willem's Pedagogy is music pedagogy that has the most um, e explored um, uh, system between musical development and holistic de development, let's say cognitive and social emotional development. So this issue is going to be addressed. I think in three weeks from now. Okay, we're a little bit, whew, we have so many questions, Peter, but we're a little bit um, crossing our time boundaries. Okay, okay. I've enjoyed, okay, thanks, sir. I've enjoyed your presentation, okay. Okay. Aha, Alinka Podboy is the other um, uh, uh, interviewee of uh, Katarina Zadnik. Uh, and Sara Smriekar is the first one. And this is going to take place on the thir uh, 30th of March. 
Uh, another question, how could we use classic music in art in kindergarten with one to three or three to six, uh, three to six year old? Okay. Um, it's it's good to uh, to use um, classical music in different settings and to know what we're using music for uh, i uh, i wrote one um, uh, one article about this how to use music in um, educational setting especially in first year of uh, first years of schooling but it's in slovene language unfortunately but i'm going to um, make um, uh, some basic uh, conclusions for, from it. Um, first, it's important to use um, classical music in some basic activities in kindergarten. Let's say that we uh, um, that we use uh, classical music uh, in slow tempo, really uh, repetitive, and um, course without lyrics instrumental music is more beneficial uh, with regard to this and we put every time before children go to sleep um, uh, classical music but it's important also to be aware of that um, uh, children like a, 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 a the th things to be uh, repetitive so they like if we use same examples many times not to change them all the time so this is one thing the other thing that we can use when we can use music as a musical background is when children are um, uh, uh, are uh, for example um, uh, when they're um, uh, when they're eating or uh, when uh, when they are let's say um, uh, when they are drawing this is many times used in kindergartens but let's go uh, on the other side let's go into more this active um, uh, um, uh, side of music we can use also classical music when children are required just to step on rhythm just to walk on rhythm and we uh, we have we have to use really simple um, uh, usually two uh, how do you binary um, uh, rhythmic patterns in music because this is much easier uh, for children so we can use it for for this or we can um, we can uh, ask children that they uh, uh, they are conductors and you give them one musical excerpt and they start uh, waving their hands it's not really for real but they're just synchronizing their body movement with um, uh, with um, uh, rhythm especially tempo in music so there are so many activities and Anya I would uh, recommend you at the end of my presentation um, uh, there are different refer uh, references and we have one great Slovene uh, trans translated to Slovene book uh, Mozart za otroke Mozart for Babies, a book written by Don Campbell, and they, there are uh, um, different examples of musical activities in different developmental stages. So if you want to know more about it, please go and uh, read this book, which is really excellent. Um, but I would like to... Uh, to finish with this uh, last uh, slide, mm -hmm. this last slide, uh, it's actually a quote from Plato. And he said, I would teach children music, physics and philosophy, but most importantly, music for the patterns in music and all the arts are the keys to learning. So we can, with all these new uh, neurological uh, findings, we're actually coming back to philosophers 
and even more back to our ancient civilization. So I suggest this is our end. I wish you all pleasant evening. It was nice being with all of you and uh, looking forward till next time. See you next week. I think a lot of uh, um, new uh, interesting things are going to be revealed next uh, week with with two um, uh, with two experts one from media psychology and the other one from um, uh, theater so see you bye bye